Hi, and welcome to the Mental Minute with Michigan Medicine. I'm your host, Will Heininger, and our guest today is Dr. Melvin McInnes. Dr. McInnes, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you very much. And you? I'm hanging in there during these, <laughs> these COVID, these pandemic, these hard times. Yes, these are very trying times for many of us, we agree that I'm um, delighted to be here and um, great seeing you. Yeah, great seeing you as well. I remember being in that home for the Christmas party. <laughs> So, we had a great time. Dr. McKinnis, we want to get into a, a bunch of your work today. Um, but before joining U of M, you had quite an interesting journey, um, including stops in Europe and, and Canada. And uh, mental health obviously has changed tremendously along the way. So, can you talk a little bit about your journey into mental health? Did it start before medical school? Did it start in residency? Did it start, um, you know, earlier than that. So can you take us through a little bit of your journey um, within the profession and how mental health has changed both in your eyes and in the field along the way? Sure. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, so my, my name is Melvin McInnes, but uh, in fact, my uh, background is Icelandic. And so I actually went to Iceland after high school and uh, loved it there. And so I ultimately stayed there and did my medical training there in Iceland. And I became interested in psychiatry really immediately after medical school. And I had the opportunity to participate in a summer research program in a psychiatry unit and um, learned about mood disorders and learned about bipolar disorder. And having participated in the care of individuals with bipolar disorder and seeing them get well, experiencing the intensity of their symptoms and the intensity of their humanity and seeing them back on track it was just one of the most rewarding experiences that one could ever have. So I got involved in research. I spent three years uh, in London <clears throat> at the uh, Mosley Hospital in London and then spent time at Johns Hopkins, 15 years at Johns Hopkins, focusing essentially on bipolar disorder and the genetics of mood disorders and then was recruited to the University of Michigan in 2004 and have been here ever since. And it has been just a, an amazing, wonderful career here at the University of Michigan. And I we're thriving and we, we just love what we do here. Absolutely, and we're thrilled to have you here. Obviously, it was a great move by our team in 2004 to bring you on board. Um, and since you've been here, uh, and we'll get to the, the Prector Bipolar Project because it's a, a major part of your work. I'm curious though, um, from your last answer, during that decade in, in Iceland um, and, and during medical school and your time there, paying attention to mental health, and Iceland being a nation that is um, so far north and mm -hmm. the amount of sunlight changing drastically at the time of, depending on the time of year mm -hmm. and how daylight can affect mood disorders. I'm curious how that comes into play and what you saw uh, over there. Well, you're talking about a seasonal affective disorder and the, the, the data really suggest that seasonal affective disorder is more common in the middle climbs. And so in around the, uh, the latitudes about 50 degrees, you know, being 35 and 55 degrees latitude, it's more common. Uh, the further north you go in actuality, the uh, frequency of seasonal affective disorders doesn't seem to be as, as great. And having lived in Iceland for a good number of years, uh, one acclimatizes amazingly well to it. And in fact, when I moved, uh, south, south to England, if you will. Uh, what I really missed was the uh, the summers where it was light 24/7 during the summer. That was that was the thing that I missed most. I bet that would be a sight to see. And so you've been with the University of Michigan since 2004, and with the Department of Psychiatry. And mm -hmm. during that time, a large study and an important study and research project uh, has come about. And you are the head of it. Um, it is known as the Prector Bipolar Research Project. And I was wondering if you can take us through a little bit of how that came to be and then where it's gone during that time, how far it's come uh, since its inception. Uh, the, the Prector Bipolar Research Program uh, was started uh, really in 2004, 2005. Our first participant was enrolled uh, in late 2005. And really the, the impetus and the idea behind the project is to understand bipolar disorder over the course of time. Uh, we've learned over the years that human health is dynamic. Things change over time. Absolutely. 
regardless of what the illness is, whether it's diabetes, depression, bipolar disorder, the illness has a pattern. And individuals experience ups and downs, difficulties, trying times, stressors, good times. And so it's very important for us to learn exactly what it is that causes people to become ill, what causes them and maintains their wellness, and just to study the pattern of the illness over time. So that's a fundamental element of what we're doing. And also to study the various different uh, factors that are involved, the biology, the psychology, the sociology, and the difficulties um, uh, and um, successes that each, each of them has. And so we also want to know a little bit about the genetics, or a lot about the genetics. We want to know uh, the biology of, of um, genetic markers and model your illness in cellular models and so on. We're doing a very extensive, extensive project. Yeah, it certainly is an extensive project uh, and a fascinating one. And you said you started with your first enrolled patient in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, how many are we up to currently enrolled in the study? So we have enrolled over 1,350 individuals that we're following on a regular basis. And so every two months we get information on how well they're doing. That is a whole lot of people. And when it comes to um, managing a, a study of, of that depth, um, when you go into as much uh, detail as you guys do, um, I know more recently an example of that is the uh, Priori, is that pronounced correctly, Priori, Priori. voice app. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask a little bit about that because it's fascinating, and I also want to know just what goes into managing a project of that scope and depth. Well, so firstly, we learn from our individuals. I learn from uh, patients. I learn from participants. I, I just learn uh, from interacting with individuals with bipolar disorder. And so over the years, we would hear frequently family members, people talking about uh, you know their their loved ones and that thing, and saying, you know, Dr. McGinnis, I just know there was something going on with my brother, my sister, my wife, my uh, husband, you know, I could just hear it in their voice. There was something different and I could just hear it. There was something, I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something different about it. And so then we asked a fundamental question, you know, if a human brain can pick up on a change like that in a person that they know very well, can we teach a computer how to do it. In other words, from the sound waves and the intonations and just the way things are said, how they're said and the energy and the emotion and the speech patterns, can we use that to identify uh, predictors of problems uh, going, you know, go, coming coming ahead of us. And so it's much like kind of a, you know, a 10-day weather forecast, if you will, to sort of see what's the likelihood of something happening downstream. And so that's what we're interested in, in identifying a risk probability. We all know the weather is not 100% correct, uh, but they're getting better over the years. And so if we can get better in psychiatry and predicting what's going to happen to our individuals that we care for, uh, I think we'll do a better job of looking after people. That's fascinating. And, and if you're an enrolled uh, patient, if you're a member of the study and say um, this 10 day, you get the, your version of this 10 day forecast, Mm -hmm. What will it spit out to you? What will that patient have access to that may help them um, look at things that keep them well or add supports? Um, what would that patient get from the 10-day forecast, as you called it? Well, I want to emphasize we're not there yet with that, but, but that's, that is our vision that we were, we're aiming for. And so what we would want to uh, get out of that would be some... You know, are there some indicators that things are not going well? And so we know just from a clinical perspective that individuals with bipolar disorder that are having difficulty sleeping, mm -hmm. that is a marker that something is going amiss. And so a couple of nights of not sleeping for an individual with bipolar disorder is not a good sign. Uh, difficulties uh, with energy levels, having too much energy is not a good sign. A lot of this can be picked up in the sound of the speech and potentially the actions of the individual. That uh, truly is, it's inspiring, it's fascinating, and um, I hope that you are able to teach a computer to notice those tonal differences mm -hmm. because it's true, family members are often the ones who are most in tune um, and yet sometimes uh, um, uneducated mm -hmm. about mental health. I know that I was uneducated about mental health until uh, I suffered from major depression in college and it sort of hit me like a ton of bricks, but 
Um, yeah. Speaking of family members, and I think I've told you some of this, but my father got diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but not until he was 55 years old. Um, yeah. And he said lithium saved his life. And he said it was the most yeah. helpful diagnosis of his life because it's explained things that he's felt for decades. And so he talks about being 14 and, and going into a library and experiencing euphoria and not understanding it. Um, right. And so I wanted to, first of all, just on, on my on behalf of my father and personally, thank you for the work you do. Um, but you. but regarding lithium in particular, um, lithium is a common treatment for bipolar disorder. And um, sometimes there's controversy around it. I saw a study that you recently uh, authored or co-authored talking about the cognitive effects of lithium or the lack thereof. Um, would you comment a little bit about um, some of the stigma potentially surrounding lithium and your clinical opinion on it, uh, the findings in your uh, most recent paper? Well, firstly, I'm so glad to know that your father is doing so much better uh, at taking lithium. And I want to share with you that I've had many people tell me that lithium has just changed their lives. And just uh, this past year, one person said to me, you know, why didn't somebody tell me about this 15 years ago? It would have saved me a lot of grief. And so lithium is one of the best medications for bipolar disorder. Unfortunately, not everyone responds in the, in the uh, most optimal way. Many people um, get on medication or get on the lithium and get up on a too high of a dose very quickly and they notice all kinds of problems with it, either uh, you know, kind of nausea or, or, uh, or other you know, GI symptoms. Other people uh, complain about you know, kind of um, um, some neurocognitive dulling, you know, if they're up too high. But really what we've learned over the past several years is that uh, getting lithium on board in a more gradual, easing it in kind of a way is a much more efficient way of getting people on lithium. So taking one's time and getting up on the medication over a gradual period of time, monitoring it, checking in with your doctor on a regular basis, and, and just you know taking it slowly and getting up to the right dose. People that are successful on lithium will report back that you know six months, 12 months, a couple of years into uh, their therapy, life is just getting better. And so it's really gratifying to talk to people who have been successful on gradually getting on lithium and gradually getting up to the desired dose and then sticking with it and working with their doctors and treatment providers to stay on course. Now, within the Prector study, and I don't know if you have access to this type of information, but if you're able to say, to see how many of your patients um, are taking lithium, what percentage would you estimate of the enrolled patients uh, take lithium as a, a form of treatment? So I think that around a third of our individuals are currently taking lithium, and um, two-thirds of them have taken lithium um, at some time in, their, in the management of their illness. Uh, but I always mention or I always say to people that <clears throat> if you have bipolar disorder, you deserve, really deserve a trial, an intelligent trial of lithium to see if it will help you. I can't guarantee it's going to help, but you really deserve a trial of it to see if it's going to help. And you deserve to have a trial that is intelligently designed gradually increased to give it a go. Now, many a person comes and says, oh, doc, you know, I don't want to take lithium. Uh, it's, uh, I've read so many bad things about it. And there are a lot of things that are written now about it on the internet. And many of them are not true. There are many of them are people that say, you know, I did this happened and that happened. And so I'm blaming the lithium or I took it and I felt bad. And, and um, so it's gotten a bit of a bad rap uh, from time to time. And so it's, um, it's important to have a really careful, informed discussion with your care provider and talk to them in detail about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for emphasizing that to start with your medical professional and your care provider, because you can find a lot of things on the internet, um, but oh, these yeah. are the people who are trained professionally to take care of us and psychiatrists specifically of our brains. And so um, one of the smartest psychiatrists I know who's helped me in my life talks about you as in the patient becoming an expert on you. And mm -hmm. I think um, 
you know, you have a much better chance of doing that, having a consistent relationship with a individual right. being your psychiatrist rather than a, I Google this and then I Google this and I get anxious because I read this and then I read this. Yeah. The important thing is that, that the management of any medical disorder, any medical illness, including bipolar disorder, depression, and any of these illnesses, it's a collaboration between the individual who has the illness, the phenomenon, and the care providing team who is helping manage it. And so together, the team can achieve phenomenal things. Without question. I know in my own personal story, when I was able to recover um, from, from really severe depression in college, it was it was a collaborative effort and it was the turning point was once all the adults in my life, all the people who I had been hiding it from, uh, in this case, my coaches at Michigan, uh, my, you know, my parents, really everybody, everybody who needed to know knew instead of me hiding it from them. And so, first of all, it felt like there was a safety net around me um, mm -hmm. and that I couldn't fail. But it also gave me the permission to see it from their perspective, which was like, sure. dude, you're dealing with any medical issue, whether it was a sprained ankle or ACL, which would eventually happen, or in this case, major depression and anxiety. And we want to get a plan to help get you back to where you and we want you to be, which is happy right. and healthy and functioning. And, and that's exactly what they did. But I, I just, I say that because I cannot endorse and underscore enough um, that collaborative approach. I'm a scuba diver, and um, one of the things that we do in scuba diving is that we have a buddy. And a buddy is a person that you're assigned to dive with, and you keep track of what your buddy's doing underwater, and you stay together and you enjoy the, the experience uh, together. So we do a pre-dive check, and we uh, just make sure our equipment is in shape and everything is fine, and we know what our buddy's equipment is. We then have uh, discussion about what the plan is, what we're going to do, what we're going to, where we're going to go, and what they, you know, you plan the dive and dive the plan. You know, as we get in the water, we do a quick check under, you know, at uh, five to ten feet, make sure there's no obvious leaks or problems uh, in that, because a big problem or a problem that shows up at the surface area can turn into a really big problem at 100 feet. So you want to have, you want to solve problems early and efficiently. Yeah. It's a, it's a process, and uh, and then when you get up above the water, you know you make sure you just keep an eye on your buddy for a minute or two, make sure nothing you know changes about him. If somebody all of a sudden gets dizzy and starts acting funny, you know maybe they did accidentally get bent or that, something like that. But like in you know in in uh, in mental health and in managing individuals, we teach them to have a have a friend, have a family, have a friend. You know you mentioned your coaches and your people that are around, were around you. You know, they were, you know, they were your buddies. They were checking up on you. And even now, going forward, you know, we have buddies. We have family members. We're checking in. Are you okay? And we signal back, yes, I'm okay, or maybe we're not okay. And we let them know, I need help. Absolutely. And like you said, that collaborative approach, you know, whether it's in, in mental health or in your scuba diving, it often does lead to success. My my greatest therapist uh, and the first therapist I had, the one in, in college who um, really helped save my life, uh, mm -hmm. shout out to, to, to Barb Hansen, she would talk about who do you want on your care team? She called it your care team, right? And that that is a, an, an intimate and important discussion, hopefully starting with your therapist and you know right. depending on your age, your parents, but um, you really choosing about who you want to let into your care, just as you would with any other serious illness. And those people each having a role and knowing their role so they don't have to worry about being the therapist if they're not the therapist, right? Or uh, prescribing medication when they've never been to medical school. I think getting a care team in order, and it sounds like you agree, um, is often very beneficial to, to recovery and, and to, uh, to positive result. Fundamental. Fundamental. You heard it from the source. All right, Dr. McKinnis, we have a couple of audience questions for you. Um, hmm. Is it okay if we transition to those? Please. All right. The first audience question is, how difficult is it to manage a research lab during a pandemic? Well, thank you for that question. And uh, I'm so glad that there's interest in how things are going in the lab. It really is. Uh, reassuring to the people that are that are working in the labs and they're working in the research projects to know that uh, you know people are worried about it or concerned about uh, folks so let me uh, break it into two parts and so there's two types of of labs that uh, that we have ongoing in the Prector program 
And firstly is the uh, is the what we call a dry lab. And a dry lab just means that um, there are individuals that are not at a wet bench. So a wet bench means that you're doing experiments with chemicals and and all kinds of um, uh, gadgets and cells and things that you have to attend to. So the individuals that are in the dry lab are able to interact with um, computers. They're able to work on data. They're able to um, look at the analysis. They're able to run the computers in the central servers and they're able to do analyses and, uh, and so on. Uh, the people that are in the dry lab interacting with our research participants are able to contact them and talk to them over the phone and run our, you know, do interviews over the phone, do interviews through Zoom or do interviews uh, by phone. So uh, that aspect of the research is, is moving along remarkably well. Where the challenges have been have been in the wet lab. So individuals that are, are working with chemicals and working with cells and and, and, and in the, you know, at the, at the laboratory benches, as soon as the pandemic became problematic, uh, we had to dial that down dramatically and really just identify which experiments could continue on for a very short period of time uh, in order to ramp them down and really shut it down. So now the laboratory people are working on the data that they had been generating over the past several months and looking at the data and thinking about the data. And so in many ways, there's a lot of creative work that's going on, even though there are no um, wet bench activities going on, but rather data are being anal analyzed, ideas are being generated and ideas are being tested and people are meeting and asking fundamental questions. What if we did this or what would the experiment look like I uh, like that. And so um, there's a lot of reading getting done, a lot of writing getting done, a lot of preparation and sort of organizing of ideas. Yeah, definitely a time to be adaptive, right? And to use the time wisely to yeah. be ready to, when the wet labs are ready to reopen. And it sounds like for the dry labs, been mostly spared or at least able to continue a, a good portion of your work. And, and Prechter being an observational study falls into that category, correct? Correct. That one of the problems and the challenges that we've had is, is amongst individuals that have found this to be a very stressful time. And so we've had a number of people connect with us um, that are having difficult times and um, using the context of, you know, freaking out or having difficulties or challenges at every level. So I just want to, um, you know, speak to that and speak to the strategies that individuals can can put in place in these very difficult times. Certainly everybody's getting fed up with being at home, everybody's getting fed up with being locked in, people want to get out and about and engage with people, but people are very scared and um, uh, worried about what's going to happen next. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. So one of the things that we're really emphasizing uh, that people pay attention to is routine to stay in a routine as much as possible. Getting up at the same time, having your evening meal at the same time, and maintaining a routine as much as you possibly can. Part of that is keeping a good sleep schedule. And so um, one of the problems with bipolar disorder is that sometimes uh, people can get reactive and they will wake into the evening or late into the, wake late into the night and then they'll work on a project till two or three in the morning. Not a good idea. Very wise to maintain as much of a regular sleep schedule as you possibly can. The third thing that I really emphasize for people is to really abstain from substance abuse, in particular alcohol. One of the concerns that we've uh, noted over the um, duration of the pandemic is that there is multi-system involvement. So there's all kinds of challenges at every organ level, including the heart. And so one of the concerns that is, was raised by a cardiology friend of mine was is that, you know, could there be some cardiotoxicity complementing, you know, from alcohol overuse and, and from the uh, coronavirus? And so it's very wise to, uh, to, to abstain from that. Also, alcohol has a tendency to, to disrupt sleep schedules and, and that. And so it just can be, can be a problem overall. And looking at the, you know, the statistics in the, Society in general, it does seem that you know that that um, at least alcohol sales have gone up. So one you know needs to be concerned about. Sure, I saw that myself, and and I was wondering your take on it. But it definitely is 
uh, sort of an enemy of sleep and of keeping a routine. Yeah. So to, to summarize, your three is keeping a routine, getting good sleep, and avoiding substances, mainly or predominantly alcohol, um, due to their effect on the first two and also potential complications with COVID, correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. I think that any substance abuse is problematic, you know, for, for individuals with bipolar disorder. And, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is, is that uh, over 60% of people with bipolar disorder will have a period of time in their life where substance abuse is a major problem. And so it's something to be to be aware of, be aware of and, and try to avoid as much as possible. And Dr. McInnes, I'm curious about when you say keeping a routine, um, the term that comes to my brain is being regulated. And why do you think it is that for human beings, and I, I think back to high school, right, and having workout and then school and then practice and then homework and dinner and bed and doing it over again. Why mm -hmm. do you think having a routine helps us, it helps regulate us so well and why that has such a drastic effect on how we feel, which then has an effect on what we do and sort of can snowball in a, in a positive way or vice versa. So can you speak a little bit to how routine regulates us? Absolutely. So firstly, our bodies and our brain love routines, period. They love it. Uh, um, um, humanity has been tr schooled and trained in routines for millennia, for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, for as long as you know, living beings have been on the face of the earth, and uh, and that is of course regulated by the solar uh, cycle. In other words, the day, the diurnal cycle. So sun sun rises and shines, uh, it rises and sets. And so there is a uh, you know, we are um, schooled, we are just uh, routined, you know, in the regular solar cycle. So we have night and day and and, and that. So uh, our body thrives at, <clears throat> on that, and just the the body has set itself in a series of cycles throughout the day in terms of um, our hormones and chemicals that increase and decrease in concentration. Our body uh, allows certain chemicals to um, increase at particular times of the day, and it's just in response to the routine that we've had over the uh, millennia, essentially. Any disruption of that will um, disrupt the normal biology of our bodies and brains. On a cellular level? On a cellular level. And so our sleep-wake cycle depends on, you know, bursts of melatonin. Uh, our brain depends on, you know, bursts of or changes in cortisol over the over a 24-hour period. Uh, we have variation in the amount of insulin that's being produced based on our appetite schedules and so on and so on. So at every level and every biological functioning, there is a cycle and a routine. Thank you, that's a fantastic answer. So I wanted to ask a follow-up question to the routine and, and sleep, you know, being such a part of it with respect with respect to bipolar disorder. And, and if circadian rhythm is real, you know, is it truly, is it affected that much? Is it, because that, that was a stark, um, you know, contrast. So I think that in, in, in bipolar disorder, there are, uh, and, and in, um, in, in general, in, in humanity, there are individuals who are night owls and there are individuals who are morning larks. And so uh, each person, for reasons that we really truly don't understand, has a tendency to be more, you know, active one part of the day versus the next. And so, uh, uh, and uh, it's often age related. So younger people are often more in the night owl kind of uh, uh, category. And um, as people get older, then uh, the mornings um, are more um, attractive in the sense of uh, there's a level of activity that's higher in the mornings. Whereas in the teenage group, you know, they, they would sleep till noon, you know, if they were given their uh, druthers, if you will. And so that's why, you know, having school start at 7 a.m. For, for a teenager is really a silly idea. Uh, it's just counter to their normal biological um, kind of rhythm. So um, that being said, I think that, that uh, when individuals um, uh, are 
ill or are being you know they're 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 in their 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 moods are unstable their lives are unstable their reactivity levels are just uh, you know hair triggered in other words something can set someone off or not infrequently someone with bipolar disorder will say you know i just got so interested in this project you know and i found myself and then i looked at the clock and it was four in the morning you know i couldn't stop myself and so then then they then that starts to get into a pattern they sleep till two the next day and then that you know continues on and so they they um the the level of uh, reactivity and and just energy you know later in the day drives them you know to uh you know to be to wake later so it's very difficult for such an individual to kind of temper themselves down into getting to bed earlier uh in the evening but it's really important to kind of train oneself to do that and so we really recommend individuals both with bipolar disorder and and, and not to try as much as possible to you know train your body to 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 align with the normal course of the day that is now, the schedule could, of the sun yeah the schedule now that just could mean that you know you're you know you're to bed at you know midnight or you know one o'clock but it's really not a good strategy to be waking till two and three in the morning every night and and um you know and then it's just you know not the way society works by and large um sure now there are people that of course that that need to um, you know work nights and shift work and that and we, we we appreciate that but not every person with bipolar disorder can successfully uh, work shift work and many many a person with bipolar cannot sure sure um dr mckinnis thank you for that i'm i'm curious um if those who might identify as a night owl um, have any hope in terms of can we change if if we're programmed one way to start out with through the course of the life cycle as you said it can change in the uh, pre-adolescent years and then the teenage years and so on um, but is it by degrees or can somebody who identifies as a morning person or, or a night owl um, make that change over time and will their, will their body um, biologically follow along I do not want to cast uh, any negative um, um, any negativity on being a night owl. Being a night owl can have many advantages, and uh, there are roles in society that need to be completed in the uh, in the later parts of the day. And many a person um, you know finds themselves just being more productive uh, at the you know, the evening hours. So when I'm working with individuals, um, both in academia and else in, in other venues, I just ask, you know, when do you do your best work? So a student may say, oh, well, I do my best work at, you know, between seven and 11 in the evening or between six and 10 or whatever period. And then I just, uh, you know, say, well, that's when you really need to work on your thesis. Other persons who say, oh, I can only get my work done, you know, first thing in the morning. That's when you really need to focus on your more difficult uh, tasks. Uh, where people with bipolar run into problems is, is that if they're, you know, if they're, you know, consistently waking into the, when I say the wee hours in the morning, like late into the evening, and, and then that becomes progressively more more late, you know, if you will. So there's a creep that can happen or a creep of, you know, bedtimes. And so uh, an individual said, well, I'm just energized and I found this project and I was waking till one, then I found myself waking till two and then three. And then all of a sudden, you know, I just couldn't get to bed till five in the morning, you know, and that. And it wasn't, it, it was, that that's the kind of the pattern that I, that I worried about, where, that I worry about. Someone who's in a regular schedule and says, yeah, you know, I don't go to bed until two o'clock in the morning and then I get up at 10. If they can live their life that way, totally fine. Uh, in that, but um, not everybody can live their life that way. Yeah, absolutely. It, it sounds like it comes back to being an expert on you, or at least paying attention mm -hmm. to what works for you. But what a good clinical question of when do you do your best work? Because it takes away all the stigma. It takes away any judgment. It's just uh, what's so, you know, as somebody who's been a, a patient and, and who is working on a, a degree to be a clinician, I, I really like that question. I just mm -hmm. want to reflect on that. Um, we have, uh, I'll say, one and a half more questions. Okay. <laughs> this one is from somebody we may both know. Uh, we will call him Jeremy in Dexter. And uh, 
we have a, a little bit of a debate about the homeland of one Dr. Melvin McInnes. I always thought that you were Canadian, and Jeremy was under the impression that you were of Icelandic descent. And I yes. know you spent time there. Can you potentially clear up this mystery for us? <laughs> so I was born in Canada, and I was born in Canada in an Icelandic community. And so uh, the um, it, it, when I was growing up, um, it, there was Icelandic spoken in the home, and so uh, and so that's how I learned. My my introduction into Icelandic, you know, was um, was there. Now, when I grew up in Canada, uh, in our communities uh, there in the Midwest, uh, everybody was a hyphenated Canadian, and uh, so you always had some identity in addition to you know being Canadian. So we were Icelandic Canadian. There were you know Irish Canadians, or there were you know Finnish Canadians, or Swedish Canadians, or Canadian Swedes, or what however you wanted to designate it. But uh, that is um, that is where that that's where we that's how we grew up thinking along those lines. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess we're both right, but I would probably tell <laughs> tell Jeremy I'm right. Um, all right, we've made it to our final question. It's the the biggest softball there is, but I like this question. Um, so it's some recommendation that you have somewhere. So it could be food. It could be you know this is the best. Cheese steak in Philadelphia, you got to visit this place, but you've been a lot of places in the world. So is there, you know, whether it's a, a place to scuba dive or a, yeah, a site to scuba dive or a restaurant you've been in your travels or some other thing that you would recommend that you'd say, this is awesome. That is a very interesting question. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been asked over the years, you know, what's your favorite place or what's your favorite, you know, whatever. And my response is that uh, my favorite place is where I am right now. Uh, because if I didn't like it as much as I like it, I wouldn't be here. So my favorite place right now is Ann Arbor, Michigan, the University of Michigan. And 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 being in my house uh, and, and, and enjoying the company of my family, my wife, and, um, and, and, and the people that I work with and, and the people that I interact with, and just the, the ambience and the culture of Ann Arbor, uh, one of my favorite um, ice cream shops is uh, now opening up, and I'm looking forward to getting some ice cream there. I'm looking forward to getting uh, you know, waiting in line at, at Zingerman's Deli, you know, and all that. So well, we can do that. Does the ice cream shop happen to start with a B? Uh, no, it's it's actually slates, uh, the blank slate. Sorry, yeah, blank slate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was getting at, but I didn't. Uh... Yeah. I didn't want to give them a plug without any advertising dollars, but it is a fantastic ice cream shop. I can second and third that. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Dr. McInnes, I like that final answer. It speaks to being present and being mindful. Um, we want to be mindful of your time, and this has been wonderful, but I wanted to turn it over to you if you had any last words of wisdom, anything you wanted to share with the people um, you know, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, any words to live by? Just wanted to give you the floor uh, to yeah. close us out. Well, um, one of my favorite things to do is to listen to the radio. And I love listening to National Public Radio. And there was a program on Saturday morning, the Saturday morning um, talks, talk shows on NPR, really interesting. And one of them was called On the Media. And there was an analogy that, uh, that, that the moderator made is, is that, you know, going into this pandemic, you know, what's going to happen to us is that it's the equivalent of a forest fire. And a forest fire just burns through everything, and we've got a catastrophe at every level going on in our society, um, both from an economic and health and, and potentially a political one as well. But uh, as the forest fire burns through, there's going to be a lot of things gone. Things are going to change dramatically. Things are going to be different. But what's going to emerge is new life. Uh, things are going to thrive that never thrived before. And so there's going to be a lot more diversity, I hope. Uh, there's going to be many, many new ideas, I hope. And there's going to be many new energized projects that are going to emerge. New life is going to take place and that new ideas and new ventures are going to emerge very strong from this. So, yeah. well, thank you for those Whatever words. I, I like the, yeah, I like the analogy, you know, during the forest fire, um, and even immediately after, it's very hard to imagine any new life. All you can see is the ashes and, and the rubble, so to speak. But as you said, you know, inevitably, 
new life abounds and uh, new programs and, and new undertakings will be needed and people will be needed for those undertakings. So thank you for those words of wisdom, Dr. McInnes. Um, and this has been the Mental Minute with Michigan Medicine.